Right. Okay, we all ready? Hi. Cool, okay. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Rap Podcast. I'm Jamie, hope you're all doing well. Joining me this week is Dr. Harley Worthy. Good evening, Harley. Good evening. That's weird, using my title. <laughs> yeah, I tried to be professional. I'm the host tonight, so I'm going to try and make this as professional as I possibly can. We, we don't normally do professional, do we? But I'm hosting, so it's going to be a lot more professional, <laughs> he says. And we have a very happy James Reese with us. Good evening, James. How are we? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. Now, Lee is not with us this week, unfortunately, but we have what I consider to be an upgrade, or not, depending on your point of view. <laughs> a voice that will be recognisable to listeners of Scarlet's Fever and the Pirate Rugby podcast is Mr Hugh Griffin. Good evening, Hugh. How are we doing? Good evening. And let me just explain why George North isn't a censor, right? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect replacement for me, isn't it? <laughs> are you going to start talking about drums? As well? uh, I've got some great <laughs> stories from the 80s. Is there going to be some great drum, drum chess? <laughs> uh, if we could not talk about George North or drums, that would be uh, great. Okay, so uh, drink of the week. Well, it's only Harley. He's only got uh, an alcoholic drink tonight. Harley, do you want to quickly just tell us what you've got? And then we'll move on. I mean, I, I've had it before. It's Butty Bach. I mean, it's, it is, I ran into the co-op thinking, oh, bugger, I haven't got a drink of the week and I best go, go get one and then no one else bothered. I've got something. <laughs> Oh, what have you got? So I've been drinking a lot of Guinness lately, so I thought um, I'd invest in one of these. Has anyone got one of these, the Nitro Surges? I haven't got one. Oh, have you heard about them? Are they so good? It... Are they any good? I'm 50-50. So it is it's better than a normal can Guinness, but is it a bit of a fast? So you talk about wanky bollocks, right? It's, it's a Guinness, right? There's no wanky bollocks about that. This is the instructions. Yeah. This, is for, this is for pouring a pint of Guinness. For audio listeners, I'm holding up a really long piece of paper. That comes yeah, in it's it. You have the to, length of you, and you have to you have to follow that. And it says you have to pour. It, you have to, and it's really specific. It's you have to hold the glass at a certain angle, and then tilt it, and end up at a certain angle. And then you leave. You fill it three quarters full, and you leave it to stand for sixty seconds. So you just imagine you got friends right. Do you want a pint? Do you want a pint? Yeah, all right. Okay, turn it on. Press the button. Wait for it to warm up. Pour it out. It's three quarters. Hugh, where's my pint? It's, like it's got to stand for a minute. Mm. And then you leave it, and then you get it to. So it is better than the normal Guinness. Is it worth the faff? You also have to buy special cans for it. I'm I'm not sold yet, but sounds too technical for my liking. Like, you're, talk, you're talking about that, but that's how you're supposed to pour again. How are you supposed to pour a draft in? It's anyway? from a can, though, man. It's 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 still from yeah. But a can. the whole idea is to get rid of it. They have this weird little vibrating thing, so you put a little bit of water in that would sort of surge, or and make the point settle properly. And, and it, it comes with good. a brush. You can see all the kind of paraphernalia it comes with. It comes with a brush, and it says you're supposed to brush it before and after each use it's a faff yeah it sounds like a bit of a faff i'm not drinking tonight because i'm full up with cold and i have been since friday just not in the mood for a drink so what i have got is a can of cherry seven up which is really refreshing and nice but it's not a beer but uh i'm quite proud of that choice anyway because it is a very uh refreshing drink james you're not drinking are you because i i I completely forgot and i'm at my in-laws um unexpectedly uh and yeah I just haven't got a drink i i didn't actually drink this weekend believe it or not. we were we we won our league this weekend my rugby team we, we secured the championship and well done congratulations it was a long old game and we it was an away game so we, we got back to the club and i sort of had one beer and i looked at the time and i was like i really want to get home for the ospreys game because let's be fair they're not showing s4c in a random <laughs> in, in, in a in a rugby club in the south of England, so I thought, you know, despite no. despite our club president being Welsh, I'm like he's he's having too good a time. So I, I went home, picked up my 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 tradition of fish and chips while watching the Ospreys, um, and sort of looked at the beer shelf and just didn't didn't drink. So yeah, I'm trying not to drink before the baby comes, but now I'm going to King's Home on Friday, um, so many ciders will be consumed. Yeah, quite right too. I, I, I honestly thought that with Ospreys finally winning a knockout game in Europe, you would have gone on the lash personally, but uh, no. No, because that would be like drinking temptation. to forget it, and I don't want to forget the fact that we <laughs> Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Right, let's move on to news desk, and we've got loads of news to get through. So, let's start at the Ospreys then. So, 
24-year-old fly-off slash fullback, Jack Walsh, he signed a new deal. Ospreys have now also confirmed a sign in a Phil Cogger singer for Leicester. I know you've already spoken about that, but um, that was confirmed just last week. And they've also signed Stefan Thomas, not the Wales Online journalist, the prop from the Scarlets. Uh, Stefan Thomas is, of course, cousins with Gav Thomas with the Ospreys, which yes, I didn't know until indeed. last week. I, I didn't know that until last week. Um, what are your thoughts on that then, James? Stefan Thomas from Scarlets, good signing? Um, yeah, I, 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 with front rows, it's generally more of a Duncan Jones signing than a Toby Booth one, by all mm. accounts. Um, and they, if I'm thinking back on the front rows that we've signed permanently, they don't sign front rows unless they see something that will aid what's already a big weapon. You know, a big part of Thomas Francis wanting to come to the Ospreys over Cardiff, Dragons or Scarlets is he wanted to work with Duncan Jones. Basically, they, they met and Duncan said, you're a terrible scrummager or you're not You're not to the standard where I think you can be. Uh, and, and Thomas Francis was, he was take, a bit taken aback by that and, and sort of motivated him. So they wouldn't pick him up if they didn't see something in him. Yeah. He's going to be inexpensive around, you know, all season bar injury. He's, he's not in danger of a Wales call up. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I, that I, was I'm, James laying the groundwork for when he does get picked for Wales. He can say, "Oh, yeah. it's Duncan Jones' turn." He's going to be a twenty twenty five lion. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's a, I think it's an absolutely fine signing, and, and I. I, I, I was surprised and how little he's played for Scarlet. Mm, that's interesting. Lee was not happy with the signing video of him in an Ospreys yeah, kit. He I, was not happy about that. No. How do we feel about that, by the way? Are, are we it, okay with that about new signings in when they're still with their clubs? I know there was a big hoo ha when Ellis Genge did it, wasn't there? You know, but um, how do you family. feel about it? I let Scarlett's fan talk about it. Catboy, what did you think of that? No, it's, it's offside for me. It is. It is. I think there should be an unwritten rule. I don't even think you should. I think a written statement, text only, on social media, and and that's it. I don't. I, I wouldn't pose with a with a jersey. I certainly wouldn't wear a full kit in the Ospreys changing room. Mm. Didn't yeah. even clean his boots, a dirty fucker. <laughs> He's probably had a training session with you already. Yeah. I said in the group chat, I said, "Do you reckon he wore? Do you reckon he wore the kit in on Monday to the Scarlet?" Said, Sorry, lads, <laughs> my kit was in the wash. At least it's not a fucking blood transfusion video because yeah. God, that is still the most heinous thing they've ever announced mid-season. But no, that's, 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 that's your Boothy point about Boothy trying to bring families together and you know get that yeah. family culture in there. Kieran Hardy is Luke Davis. Davis's, yeah, Kieran Hardy and Luke oh. Davis. Yeah, yeah. So it's even more. I don't think... It's cousins who also play the same position. Yeah, yeah. If, if we're signing Joe Cock and a singer on a one-year contract and making him centre at the end of his career, I'm telling you, it, it's happening. Hmm. Yeah, maybe we'll see. I was just about to say, I don't think anything will ever beat that blood transfusion Ospreys. Garbad's that was a different but management, different... Cringe, nothing will ever top that, I don't think, for sheer cringe. Hey, we, we've made up for it now. With the, that Crocodile Dundee one the other day was hilarious with Jack Walsh. Oh, and the, tw- the Twin Town one, nothing will top that. The, nothing will top that was the good. Harry Deeves Twin Town one. They've had their game, haven't they, the Ospreys, on the social media side? They've got a completely, it has been new, noted. They've got a completely new team. They've literally had a new social media admin start last week as well. Ah, um, right. Okay. Um, but the actual guy who does the, who's head of the like output of stuff, he's really good. Uh, and Bethan, who's head of marketing in general, who's Robbie's close personal friend, is um, they're, they're really, it's a young team. And you can see that by the yeah, definitely. the content they put out. My favorite socials admin is the Cardiff fan who sometimes gets hold of the Cardiff account and just, <laughs> just starts tweeting. Starts doing really unprofessional tweets. <laughs> Look, right, I'm, I'm already <laughs> digging three accounts as it is. Right, the fourth one is just too much. Just too much to be serious on. Oh dear. Okay, so that's the Ospreys. Let's move on to the Scarlets. A lot of news for the Scarlets, a lot of transfer rumours. So let's get into it. So, 
tight dead prop, Harry O'Connor, he signed a new Scarlet's contract. And in the rugby transfer rumours, this is from Rugby Pass, Exeter Lock Jack Dunn is on his way to the Scarlets. And they've also reported that Scarlets have been offered a chance to sign three props from the Lions. So it's brothers Ruan and J.P. Smith, along with Ruandrea. Should point out the Smith brothers are 34 years old and Ruandrea is 33, so they know spring chickens. And then Wales Online are reporting that the Scarlets are set to sign Scotland prop Alec Hepburn from Exeter Chiefs in what was described as, and I quote, a major transfer coup. I think that's some seriously heavy lifting going on there, major transfer coup. But anyway. Does it uh, say the word English Wales Giants reported. anywhere in the article? Nor does it say highly rated either. Those oh. uh, quote powerful. quotes are not in there. All powerful. All powerful. But also, Australian second row, Max Douglas, no mean either. Um, he's been signed from Japanese outfit Yokohama Cannon Eagles. So, um, yeah, a lot of transfer rumours coming out of the Scarlets. Hugh, do any of those names excite you at all that you're being linked with? It's very... So we're going to do a transfer deep dive on Scarlets Fever tonight. It's very difficult to say whether a signing is good or not until we know who's leaving. So apparently mm. we've already signed two non-Welsh qualified locks in Jack Dunn and Max Douglas. We've already got two non-Welsh qualified locks starting for us every week in the second row and a third one starting at number eight. And then also Tane Plumtree, who is Welsh qualified, but he isn't exactly homegrown, which is fine. I don't have a, a problem with having non-Welsh qualified players, but having arguably six non-Welsh qualified locks at the Scarlets at once is odd. So it suggests that a couple are leaving. But then there's rumours going around that the two Tonga Moines are saying, and I can't believe that Alex Craig is leaving unless he's been signed by Toulouse, obviously, um, or Leinster. Um, I, I don't know. And the the Alec Hepburn one as well, he could be a great player and fantastic. If you're going to sign non-Welsh qualified players, why sign current internationals for other Northern Hemisphere teams? Because it's basically the same as signing a Welsh qualified player in terms of availability. So... Yeah, it, all these players are, are great, and it it's kind of been this trend with the scholars. Because remember last summer, where everyone was worried about all the regions going bust, and we made like Tame Plumtree and Yoan Lloyd and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, load of signings, and then we've made three in season signings of um, Edwin Swartz. Um, Man of Van der Merwe. No, he hasn't joined us yet. He's for next season. Oh right, okay. Uh, Jared Taylor, yes, he exists, and um, Joe Jones. <laughs> Joe Jones. Uh, oh dear. Say Will, no more. Gr Will Griff John. His ability to pick a tight head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on the on the Lions props. So the reason that the Lions are looking to offload props is because the Curry Cup and the URC no longer clash, so they don't need yeah. as big a squad. So it's so for people who don't know the hierarchy in South Africa, right? South African teams get their best players taken by foreign clubs. The Lions get their best players taken by other South African teams. That's how no money they've got. So when the Lions are ringing you up and saying, do you fancy a prop? We'll give you anyone. It's not a good sign. If I do, <laughs> if I did want to get a prop from the Lions, it would be in Slava Kanye um, because mm. he's pure vibes and he weighs 158 kilograms. And he's definitely getting called up by Gatland. Yeah. Um, but are, are these signings any good? I'm more interested in who's leaving because if you actually write down our squad on paper, we are about four deep in every position. And there is some players that you would be shocked that still pick up a paycheck from the Scarlets every month. Mm. I I'd be surprised if they're going to keep both Lousy and Faye for Fifta. Purely because, going, you know, we have to. Well, well, that's what I mean. Because if the budgets are going down, those guys are not going to be cheap if they sign new deals, are they? They're going to take up a fair chunk of the, the playing budget. So do you think both will stay then, Hugh? Is that what you're hearing? The, the, the rumours from the usual places are suggesting that both are staying, even though it was also heavily rumoured just a few months ago that Lousy was already gone and he has since come back. Of course, I'd love to keep both. They're both incredible players, especially for Fita. Um, but I'm, I've got no doubt that he's got uh, his, his pick of clubs that he could go to because he is probably the best player currently playing in Wales. Like, he's ridiculous. Um, but, yeah, I, yeah, I would love to keep them, but I would I would be surprised. But like I say, the Scar all the 
for all of the, the budgets that are going down and for all the loss that we posted last week and things, all of the news coming out of the Scarlet is about the, how much money we're spending. So mm, it's, a, that, it's just a confusing one. With that, though, um, Stefan Thomas pointed this out on Twitter, is that every rugby club is in debt, right, and post debt every year. Yeah. It only matters if that debt isn't serviceable. So all you're doing, if if you're splashing this cash, it just means that you are definitely losing players who are on a lot more money. So Scott mm. Williams, you know, you just haven't like oh, Osprey's in that position because we've already announced that George North and Nicky Smith are going. So immediately people are like, well, that frees up money in the budget. So I just have to I just have to mention one thing on that um, when. You signed Phil Cock on his finger and Lance Bradley tweeted, yeah, players going from England to Wales, we do it differently here. I'm like, sorry, the Nicky Smith news was last week, Lance. <laughs> we have memories. <laughs> also, you've got to forget, Yoan Lloyd signed from England to Wales. You've had... I don't know, uh, yeah. Was he living, in, was he living in Bristol, it, though? I reckon he was living in Chaps, though. Like, he, he's no way. <laughs> Yoan Lloyd. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm saying that when uh, Lewis Rezant was at Gloucester, he's still living with he's living with his brother in Cardiff, and then going around the London yeah. city every week. Gloucester might as well play in the URC next season because apparently, like every player is every Welsh player is going to Gloucester. They could, they could, they could technically have a full Welsh back play. Yeah, yeah. Gloucester Welsh. So, Nicky Robinson does not travel far for his agency work. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Okay, so um, that's the scar. Let's move it on then to the Dragons. So all last week, the Dragons announced their next generation signings. So these were young players that were given new deals by the club. And those players were Harry Ackerman, Joe Westwood, Shea Hope, Morgan Lloyd, Ollie Andrew, Ewan Rosser, Sam Scarf, and Ryan Woodman. Um, yeah, really good news for Dragon supporters. Because as I said on Twitter, good recruitment is vital for any club. But it's just as important to keep your you know, your young homegrown talent as well, because we've lost far too much of that to English clubs. So it's really important that all the regions keep hold of their homegrown young talent. And there's some very talented players in there. You know, Harry Ackerman and Ryan Woodman, I think, will go on to uh, really big things. And we know that Shea Hope and Morgan Lloyd and Ollie Andrew have been tearing it up in the Welsh Premiership. It's just whether they can make the next step up now to the URC. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, pleasing, encouraging to see us keep hold of our homegrown talent. And in surprising news today, there was two bits of surprising news. The first bit of surprising news was that Dragons and Argentina scrub half Gonzalo Bertrand was joined Cardiff on loan until the end of the season. Uh, I didn't see that one coming. What about you, Harley? That's a good pickup for you, isn't it? How do you feel about that? I mean, it's it's good to have an extra scrum half as we were starting to look quite um there with letting Jamie Hill go to the sheep sheep shield, which again came out after the pod last week. He's mm. he's left with immediate effect. It was uh, basically Ellis Bevan and. James is a favourite ex Osprey scrum half. Which is who? <laughs> Remind us. Matt Aubrey. We, we won't say any more about that. Just, <laughs> just, just because I don't want... Because uh, James already has all the squidges lawyers on, on retainer as it is. Bastards. <laughs> Dragons fans are not happy about this. I've been on the forum. So they're like, why are we letting him go to Cardiff? What's going on? And it's like, he started, but well, he's actually played two games. For Dragons this season, he's had a lot of injuries. This the World Cup. Also, he has started twice for Dragons in the past two years. We've barely seen the guy, you know. So it's like, well, it's we've England, got we're stacked it? for scrum halves. Why not let him go? I mean, I I think it's the fact he's gone to Cardiff has pissed a lot of fans off. And actually, I make that now the third player you've had from us on loan because there's Max it's Clark, screen. Oh, it's Josh. This yeah, this season. Josh also. Josh Reynolds, Max Clark, and Gonzalo Birchner. So this is the third yeah, Dragons you player. Cut and long. Lewis Jones. Oh, thanks a bunch. Yeah, we should be really appreciative <laughs> of that, shouldn't we? What's wrong with Matthew Screech? Oh, he's all right, I suppose. Don't get me started on Lewis Jones, though. Uh, right, okay. Moving on. Uh, can I, can second... I say something Go on, then. very quickly? What? Is if there isn't a chant in the tune of J Ho to uh, Jay Hope's name in the next year, you might as well release him. Because that is the biggest missed opportunity in Dragons history. The car, I said the kind of Blues brother guys, the the guys in the corner with the drums, the they'd, drum they'd be all over that straight away. Mm. Don't mention yeah. drums, okay? Drums, no, yeah. no drums. Drums talk is banned on this pod. Right. So, in the other bit of surprise news that broke today, 
Monday afternoon, Dragon centre Jack Dixon. He's retired from rugby at the age of 29. His decision to quit the sport after 13 years is not injury-related. Uh, Dixon said, rugby in the Dragons has been a huge part of my life since I was 16 years old. But it feels the right time to step away, move on and start the next chapter of my life. Dixon became the youngest player to play Welsh regional rugby when he came off the bench at an LV Cup match at Wasps in October 2011, aged just 16 years, 313 days. And he broke the record set by teammate Hallam Amos just 33 minutes earlier when he had started the same game. Uh, he made 172 appearances for the men went over 13 seasons and he currently stands six in the club's all-time appearance list. I actually think it's a bit sad, to be honest, because uh, Dixon's been a great servant for the Dragons. Um, I think we'll miss his physicality and his grunt in the centre. And um, I, I did hear murmurings that Dixon was considering giving up the game. Um, I, I just don't think he's happy with rugby anymore. I just think he wants a career without it. I think he's fallen out of love with the game, which does happen. I suppose, but um, it's a big shame. Um, yeah, because it feels like he's been around forever, doesn't it? Like I said, making his debut at 60. So uh, I wish him all the very best in whatever he does next. A, a very these streets won't forget player. Yeah. I got a lot of time for Jack Dixon. I mean, he, he wasn't at national standard, but he was a very solid club player. And everyone, every team needs that, that solid club pro, and Dixon was certainly that. That record is such a Welsh rugby thing. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like we went, through, we went through last week on the Airy. We looked at the um, 2006 uh, Heineken Cup and it's Scarlet's uh, had, had held the record for the um, most amount of match points in the competition since that bonus points were introduced. Um, only for it to be broken two hours later, that'd be a it. It is very well, Shrugby. And now they have a okay. completely new record, which I'm sure they don't want to talk about. Yeah, but it's it. at least we're not beer rits. Have you seen about them? They're in the pro they do. They've just been bought for a one euro by a former player. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so moving on then. Other news that broke today. TV rights. So all 21 matches in this year's Autumn Nation series are going to be shown on TNT Sports after the broadcaster won the rights. Matches are also going to be shown on a sister platform, Discovery+. Plus. And the rights deal covers the UK and Ireland. Now, as of yet, there's no news on whether S4C are going to pick up the Welsh language rights. So we have to wait and see on that. But um, I'm just wondering, so what do we think of this then? Is this a good move? Do we like TNT's rugby coverage? How do we feel about all the autumn tests moving from Amazon to TNT? I'm going to break it up into a couple of questions. So I think it's great because I already have TNT, so I'm not paying for another service. Same. No, I don't like the coverage. Yeah, and same. three. Move, the closer we get to a single platform, the better, because that's something yes. I think we've all been hanging on the drum of. Is actually just having one place to go, and you're not managing multiple subscriptions. So you know, so we're saying, oh well, it was eight quid a month for for Amazon. It's thirty pound a month now for BT. I went, yeah, but it's thirty pound for BT and night. But you know, for some people, it's thirty pound a month and eight pound a month plus. I don't know, I think I paid for the 90 quid for the year for the for, for Dyer Plays coverage, soon to be Premier Sports um, next week. You know, and it just all sort of starts stacking and stacking and stacking. So actually, I quite happily pay 30 quid a month to have all to have most of the rugby I watch on one channel. It does suggest, mm. though, that they're looking that to, you know, it looks like TNT might be a forerunner into buying up all the competitions. The only problem is that does mean more Austin Healy. And... Yeah, that's it, isn't it? That's the problem. Yeah, Austin mm-hmm. Healy's great when he's actually doing what his job is, which is to analyze attack attacking patterns. And you know, when he yeah. starts talking about like stroke plays, it's really insightful. But I can't be dealing with any more ref chat. I get enough of that from no. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I I was thinking today, like, no, I don't like TNT either. But I don't really like anybody's rugby coverage. To be fair, the only one that I do like is S4C, and I don't speak Welsh, so I'm mostly that's why. <laughs> I mostly like it because I don't know what they're on about. Um, like Via plays some of the pundits that Via play get on, not naming any names, Shane Williams, Tom Shanklin, um, just really n- not a fun listen. Um, so I guess it's kind of like a, a zero sum game in terms of the quality. It's just I, I don't have a TNT subscription. I've got Sky um, for the Formula One, the football and Super Rugby. So adding this right. on as well is it's a proper 
properly going to have to think about how I manage it. I might have to cancel Sky for the autumn and then get TNT. Um, on also, yeah. also, I cast, so I Chromecast stuff from my phone is how I watch all of my content. So I don't, I don't have proper, you know, channels on the telly. And the Discovery Plus app was abysmal. It is the worst one I've ever used. And I'm including the Premier Sports Player. Remember that. Um, it, the, Will we seeing it again? I, I delighted the day that I deleted the Discovery Plus app off my phone. Also, unlike Amazon, where there's good st- other good stuff on there to have it with, I had to flick through like Discovery Plus. There's nothing really good on there. Like, there's, no. in my opinion. So, I mean, you can say the same for Veerplay, but Veerplay is a lot cheaper. Um, well, no, you haven't listened to our Scandinavian uh, <laughs> uh, film uh, recommendations. Oh, that's true. That's true. And also, Veerplay, oh, Veerplay as well has the top 14. I can't be missing out on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Uh, I'm not happy, but you know, powerless. I do think that S4C probably will retain the Welsh language rights, though. Is my gut feel hopeful? I think there's a, there's a there's a thing in the Senate in like the Senate Charter that says that they have to have live sport available in Welsh commentary, which is why Amazon did the cheeky thing and mm. just went, "Oh, we'll just hire two blokes to chat do comms in Welsh, and then we don't have to share the rights." Mm. Yeah, James, your thoughts. I remember sending this rumor to you guys in the rap chat. And you, did, you were yeah. like, it, it might just be the England games. And I was like, no, it's definitely going to be all of them. And it's a bad idea. Um, I agree that rugby needs money, right? And this is clearly a big money deal. Um, whether we actually see any of said money is, is another thing. Um, I don't mind it being centralized, right? I have no issue with that. If my issue is with the quality of commentary and the quality of what are we presenting to to the public, uh, you know, I remember when Sky Sports had the Pro Twelve and Pro Fourteen and various other things. They did some good stuff. Sky Sports with the Lion, you know, when when it was centralised, they genuinely had some really good stuff. When early days of BT, they had a proper Rugby Tonight show and it was really good. You know, when Scrum 5 was at its best, it was a genuinely good show. And that's when, you know, S4C was showing like Glasgow versus Leinster because it was a semi-final of the Pro 12 that year or something like that. So when stuff is centralised, I think quality can improve. It's just with the quality of punditry and commentary on TNT at the minute, it's so poor. You know, they are not going to have a clue when... Ireland and say Ireland or Wales play each other. T- no, none of the TNT pundits regularly watch URC rugby. Yeah, Sam Warburton and Brian O'Driscoll don't watch the URC. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, Sam Warburton's a board member at Cardiff. Yeah, you know. Did you see the bit of him last night? He's talking about none of the URC teams go away, go away to um, South Africa and win. And you're like, you're literally on the board for a team that did it, you dick. But, oh, it, it, no. that, but that, that, that's the thing like mm. this is the level we're working with and actually I was really glad at the start of the season to see Sarah Elegance become a freelance because she's been popping up on Scrum 5 and everywhere else because she's great like she's great as a headline presenter but your the, the the level of punditry around it needs to be so much better and Amazon in all fairness did it without agendas and its referees and all this crap. They they genuinely had a good product. I enjoyed it. They did. Yeah. And they hired Gabby Logan, which is always going to be a win. Yeah. Hired Gabby yes. Logan. You know, you get someone like Lauren Jenkins involved. So I have no issue with it being centralized. And that's where we're heading is to a subscription based centralized model. We all know this. Yeah. Um, yeah that's fair enough. Yeah. But I like Amazon's coverage. I agree with you. I, I like I it. Do. And this the is quali- my concern with TNT. Well, you're saying. I'm concerned it's going to be too England centric, yeah. you know, for the reasons you've already mentioned. Yeah. Well, they're, they're at the weekend, the biggest game of the weekend was Stormers La Rochelle, hands down the biggest game. Didn't have any pre match build up at all. Just started it was, when the it was t- kickoff. Oh, yeah. went. I, I missed the I missed recording it because it didn't show up on the normal channels. It didn't flash up. Is the, that is that the, because though it's a South Africa TV rights thing? I don't because it. because the challenge. I know it's a challenge cut. The shark zebra game wasn't even on Viaplay. 
I think it's because um, trans, trans Cut though is such a hodgepodge. If there's a local broadcaster you'll pick it up, so like the I'll oh, see Ospreys was on S4C, so they didn't put it on Viaplay, whereas in like the URC it's on both. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just not sure. I think it's just what one the of those things. Viaplay is... just pick up everything that isn't covered. And even then, I think the Benetton game was still on EPCR TV. Yeah, it so was, and that's mad. Only, that was a big game. Keeping, yeah. I think they're only keeping the... Um, I think Viaplay only had the ones involving a French team that didn't have another broadcaster. So I think, because, was it, it was Benetton... Benetton versus the Lions. Lions. Ho versus yeah, Connacht. So, yeah. so, I don't know if that was the case, but here he's actually right, you know, it has to... You know, nowadays we're getting like five minutes, even on URC games and on Viaplay, you get five minutes pre match. To be fair, I don't watch pre match stuff personally. I like, I, I even, I've even like come up with activities that to do that take 10 minutes at half time. I don't watch any of that. I just watch no, the actual game. Th- that's absolutely fine, but you've got to have the opportunity for people mm. to watch it and to enjoy it. That's how you grow the game more than someone just watching eight matches of rugby where. In fact, they can watch eight pre-match and half-time build-up of, an, of actual genuine analysis where they learn about patterns of play, defensive structures, laws of the game, not Carl Dixon is a complete and utter twat and missed this or Andrea Piardi's bald and, and can't referee a game properly. Yeah. That, 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 that's what it is. I do not want to hear Lawrence Delalio talking about Stormers versus La Rochelle. Like, that's true. I don't want to hear him talking about anything, to be honest. Um like, did you see and, um, when Sarri's got absolutely destroyed by Bordeaux for the second time this year, he said, oh, it's because Bordeaux are a super club and Sarri's can't compete with them financially. And it's like, <laughs> so, oh, no how the mighty there, have Lawrence. fallen. Yeah. <laughs> no sympathy there. No, you're right, though, TV coverage has got to improve. And I'm still annoyed that I paid seven quid to watch Zebra versus Dragons on bloody EPCR TV and of course the Dragons lost and I tell you what I will not be doing the next <laughs> season I can tell you that now we will not be making that mistake again yeah, right. on my beer. I can top that I can top that I once got a coach back from London to Swansea and decided to pay it's like five ninety nine for Gloucester versus Saris on a Friday night and it was fucking awful yeah. it was it was genuinely terrible yeah it's not great to say. Like I said, it will be, I won't be doing it again next season. Like I don't care. I will not be paying extra to watch the Dragons on the streaming service. Right, okay. Uh, the only bit of news I got left is Clan Dovery. They beat Murphy 20 points to 18 to win the Premiership Cup at the Principality Stadium. Did you watch this one, Hugh? I, I think I was multitasking. I had it on. Uh, the pitch looks horrible. Could they not have watered the pitch? Yeah. I they played three games on it that day. But I, I, they hadn't yeah. they hadn't even scrubbed the Guinness logo off it from the um, Six Nations. Um, yeah. Pretty, it it wasn't a great game, and I don't know about Thunderbird because they obviously got beat by Newport the other week. They had. Um, why are you giving a thumbs up, Harley? You're not a Newport fan. Well, we're not talking about the it's Queens match, all right? <laughs> um, um, so yeah, <clears throat> it was a bit. It was a bit of a controversial one at the end because there was a high tackle, but before the high tackle, the player had stepped into touch, but they didn't go back for it, which I'm kind of okay with. It wasn't a great game and it wasn't a kind of his best performance by any means, but for me, they are clearly, well, the record speaks for itself. I think they are the best team in the premiership, so they probably deserve to win the cup. I I think they're absolutely deserving winners, Um, but you would have expected it to be more comfortable, to be honest, based on the season so far. Our play does supersede everything. We just had to point out, so the foot in touch wouldn't have mattered. So, and that's not the first time that Merthyr player has done it because he did it against Newport earlier in the season, if you remember. Uh, I actually said, I think I sent it to you actually. Um, yeah, I don't mind catching the odd Welsh Prem match on a Thursday night. So good, good watch mm, most yeah. of the time. I said, um, I, Land every Newport was actually really good for very good sixty game. minutes. Yeah, I enjoyed that one. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right then. Okay. Let's move on. Shall we talk about what happened on the weekend? History was made. Ospreys, they're history makers. They finally won a European knockout game. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's right. The Ospreys sealed their place in the Challenge Cup quarterfinals with a 23 15 victory over Sale Sharks at the Brewery Field in Bridge End. Which means now on Friday night, the Ospreys will travel to King's Home to take on Gloucester 
for a place in the semi-finals. Come on then, James. Tell us all about it. Your thoughts, right, let's get it. Let's get it the way first. Uh, let's get it the way first. Yes, yes they'll put their B team. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, so, so there's... Uh, Varying reports that Sale were absolutely fuming when they turned up at the change on room situation. Um, <laughs> Good. But don't have a leg to stand on because they didn't send a representative down prior to kickoff, like in the week before, um, to, to inspect facilities. So they can't form a, uh, they can't lodge a formal complaint. But can they, they can't veto it though, can they? They can't say, no, we're not playing it. They can't, they, they, they what normally happens is they just they just come down to look at what they can bring down in terms of facilities and, and like right so we can bring do we need to bring more physio tables or other physio ta- you know stuff like that practical practical things um so yeah sale brought their b team down they they made 11 changes but again as i keep pointing out to people that's not the osprey's fault the osprey's can only play what's in front of them exactly um, yeah and that's 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 a bloody good B team, if I've ever seen one. There's some good players in there. Yeah, um, yeah it, was, it, it was. It probably wasn't the most vintage of games. It was back and forth, very physical, as we knew it would be. It was sale. They like to play in the game line a lot. Um, I thought we weathered the storm very well early on. Obviously, we went uh, twenty pun. points or three. Is it actually yeah. was raining? Um, I thought our back row were immense. Um, Harry Deves, how good is Harry Deves? Oh, he's, he's so good. Just he? what a such player! A, but as Hugh said to me in a message, and he's smiling because he knows what I'm about to say, is I trust him with my life on a rugby pitch. But if it was a test, it was the eleven plus, not so much. Um, he does, <laughs> he, when he, when he speaks, he is like, "You all right?" But in a good way. Like, my mum texts me. He's just me. so he rugby, like, and all he cares about is rugby. My mum texts me. Is like, have they just picked this man up from like the local police station after a night out? Like, he, he's just. I love him so much. Um, he is the. Can I just ask? Can I just ask a quick question about Harry Teams? Is it yeah. true he hates Tories? Yes. Right. So <laughs> when he, he hates first, Tories, when he first rose to fame, <laughs> or like when he first gained prominence, he, he was playing in. A, red, a very poor under twenties team, mm. and remember he had a re- really, really, really good game. And I was like, "Oh, this Harry Dees fellow is quite good." And then it turns out he was Osprey. I, I had no prior he was Bridgen College, yeah. So I looked at his Twitter, and he's just retweeting a load of anti-Tory stuff, <laughs> like just yes. blatantly anti-Tory stuff. And, and every now and then he'll pop up like quote tweeting like a politics tweet, and it's just blatantly anti. And he's so upfront about it. So immediately it was like me, Josh Gardner, and Robbie Owen. It was like, this is my favorite person ever. Have you ever been on Rio Dyer's Twitter? Yeah. That's a good laugh. It, it, it's just so, yeah, he, he hates stories and, and, and just loves playing on grass. He loves rugby. I love him even um, more. Oh, that, that, that segment about playing on grass was that on Saturday night was just wonderful. It just you know brought a tear to an old man's heart. Yeah. He, so, yeah, back row were immense. Um, I thought Ruben Re- Re- Morgan Williams controlled the game very, 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 very well. Um, he's now Thomas is injured. He is Wales's most consistent nine in club rugby, I'd say, form wise, because he's played the most. I'd imagine he was I'm trying to remember his spreadsheet. <laughs> Can I shock he's you? I haven't down. done any analysis on Ruben Morgan Williams. Well, no, yeah, I don't need to. He's amazing. Um, need to, yeah, he's not going to get picked for Wales. No, that's true. Um, no, it's just a you know, really good time. Scrum was great. Um, that Astro Poker for Jaw, who's a fantastic prospect, you know, demolished Wales in the under 26 nations, got taught a bit of a lesson. Um, by Gareth Thomas. Same thing happened to him though, down in um, Cape Town. Ex- yeah, it happened, um, in at Northampton as well. Um, Maybe so, nineteen-year-olds shouldn't be scrummaging against fully grown men. True. Um, I, yeah, I just I can't. I was just too. I have not watched the game back. I've barely watched the highlights because I'm just remembering 
how good a feeling it was. And I, I, I don't care about the attendance. I don't care about the... Um... I was going to ask you about that. I'm really sorry, but I was going to ask because the only reason I bring it up, so the official attendance was 4,225. Now, yeah. what I would say was I was shocked by that because watching on television, it looked more than that. So I'm just going to ask yeah. you, how disappointing, if, if that is an accurate figure, which, you know, that's what was announced, how disappointing is that? Because it is an 8-capacity venue, isn't it? 8K-capacity venue. So I, You say it's an 8K-capacity venue. 8K-capacity in that is, if you're in the shed, in the cow shed, you are elbow to elbow. You cannot move with someone. That's like, you. from what I could gather, speaking to people who were in the shed, it was, it was full. But you had just enough. You had room to sort of turn around, if that makes sense. Um, so I spoke to Lance. Four two 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 four two two five was the official ticket sold. Originally, the plan the plan was always to take it to Bridgend. Originally, they wanted to do what Cardiff did a couple of weeks ago, or months ago, with the junior clubs, and they were going to make it a big junior club event. Hmm. But they got shafted with an eight pm kickoff. Which is really tough if you want to get young, younger kids to a game like that. Yeah. What I will sense. say is, I can't find the official Cardiff attendance anywhere. They're saying eight k for that. It I've felt got it. louder than. Oh, you got the Cardiff attendance. Yeah, I've got them all. Well, for the I, kids, I, like... I, I track attendances because they are, in my opinion, the most lied about thing, um, in. Yeah, rugby. we all know your opinion on Cardiff Rugby's attendances. No, no, it's not that. There are some very well-known and very prominent Twitter accounts and personalities who tweet big lies about attendances quite regularly. Um, so I like to keep track on it. So I, I, I messaged you, didn't I, James, when that 4,200 yeah. came out and I said, this is the official attendance. It doesn't look right. And it, 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 by all, all accounts, it, it did. Now, I, I hear the thing about the the kids getting in but at mm. the same time i'm not sure that um you know for a european knockout game should you be relying on kids to boost up the numbers no it, it's, it's it's not necessarily about boosting attendance figures it was about what they wanted to do in terms of the whole brewery fest thing mm. they wanted to make it this family festival type affair and by all accounts that festival bit was really successful speaking but, to people they that, that that bit was great is the fact that they wanted more bodies in in the actual arena, call it, hmm. and and to have a section for junior clubs to be represented, it, it yeah. is what they wanted to do. It did, it did look great on telly, and I was like I said, very surprised when that figure came out. It was eight thousand one hundred fifty nine on New Year's Day was the official figure, and I, I was at that game, and you were in the I gazebo. Could, I was in I was in I was in the conservatory. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is where the big screen was in 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 that. Um, it uh, and speaking to Robbie and Yestin, it didn't look that much different, if I'm honest. Um, and certainly sounded a lot better. You could hear the singing, the hymns and arias, the Emerald Heads are in there, you know. So, yes, the actual gate number is disappointing. Don't get me wrong, right? I'm not going to say four two two five is not where we want to be, but mm. in terms of atmosphere and how how it all panned out brilliant and what really made me happy i was speaking to yes and robert as well it was a younger crowd so you could see when they did one of the 800 crowd shots in the game yep. what's that, his name stephen jones was so happy about yeah it was um <laughs> it it was about um it was younger it was students it was you know 18 to 35, if you want to call it, you know, that bloke hilariously trying to chop the pint or, you know, groups of young, you know, we had people tweeting us, the people who listen to the Irie pop, you know, young, younger, younger guys who are passionate about the club and things like that. So that was really pleasing for me is that at the, at the Swansea.com, it's very, it feels like an older crowd, but at the brewery field, it looked like a younger crowd. So Mm, can we go back and talk about the game now? <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah, well, we, we can. Yeah. Um, um, oh, oh, go on then. Go on, then you go. You, you tee up the questions, I'll answer them. 
I had, I had a few little stats just to, just to go, go on then. Go on. <laughs> so the the big one I'm really impressed with because Ospreys have struggled for me. Ospreys have struggled a bit in the series. If you look at the points per twenty two entry, Ospreys are averaging three and a third points for which is decent. You're getting over a penalty a time to sales one point five, which meant you're holding them out. They they sale had far more twenty two entries. I think about double actually. So that's you know sign sign to the defence. Um, scrum and line up. Weirdly, this is a re according to the rugby pass anyway. The scrum was awful. So yeah, sixty three percent. Sixty three percent, and um, but sales was only twenty. But you had a ninety three percent line out. Sales down to a very nice sixty nine. Um, nice. because and now as a stat because Jamie likes quoting it and Hugh hates it. Tackle percentages. Uh, mm. so Osprey's eighty six percent to James is ninety four percent, which just says. Most of the most of the traditional stats on this were bollocks. One interesting thing I found was pretty much all the rugby was played between the half. Everyone's possession was in between their halfway and the opposition twenty-two. Pretty much mm-hmm. almost all the ball. Yeah, that was to be expected though with the conditions. I think. I think conditions you, and the sort of teams you both are. But it was you, you. You're not going to play line break rugby in an Ospreys as a sale defense, especially Ospreys defense as, as well. But it's not heavy the line breaks, is it? It's not. No. You know. It's not Quinn's Glasgow line breaks or Bordeaux Saracens line breaks, is it? It's Johnny McNichol. Yeah. Fuck it. I was going to say Cardiff. <laughs> make loads of line breaks. Just do fuck all with them. Um, so, so yeah. I, the defence stat doesn't surprise me in terms of how we actually set defensively. I thought that's where the back row really came into their stride because it was set up for Harry Deves and Justin Tipperick to attack the breakdown. And they did. Oh, there was, was that absolutely wonderful Harry Deves turnover. That I, I know exactly the, exact the one you're on about. But there's, uh, and it, I there's think was, I'm pretty sure it was first one. half, and yeah, and and it was the big twelve. He went on a crush ball. I think Morgan Morris yanks him over, and Deves is just yeah. over and pickpockets him, and it is just absolutely it's, beautiful. It's glorious, proper old school fetcher stuff. Um, you, yeah, so, so it was set up for for that. In terms of how we used the ball, we kicked what thirty-three times or something like that. So we kicked heavy. Thirty-two. I think Owen thirty-two. Owen Williams struggled. I think off the obviously struggled off the tee, and that's been a yeah. big bugbear of mine this season. Um, he's at like fifty percent goal kicking this season, and it's it's unacceptable. Um, yeah, it's quite poor, isn't it? Manny the box looking at that, going, "That's rubbish, mate." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he makes Manny LeBoc. He makes Manny LeBoc look like fucking prime Lee Halfpenny. Um, but out of hand, <laughs> I think after after the first sit few, he kicked really well. Um, and yeah, I, Owen Watkin is looking more and more steady. Steady. He's just consistently very good at what he does. He really impressed me. Yeah, I'm liking them switching him and Keith around a lot. And yeah, I what's going on with that? that? The, jerseys, the jerseys don't really mean anything for those two. Maybe yeah, what? Because like Keith's whole thing is the, you know, the game line twelve and stuff, and Owen has played thirteen a lot more than he has. So what is the? Is it? Is it like a pure case of numbers don't matter? Is it? Yeah, very much. So I don't. So the way Owen used to play. In the very in the in like the end of the Tandy era, it's when he made its debut. Right, was uh, the way Osprey's used to play is sent, the centres used to set up on either side of the ruck, and they would lead the line from either side of the ruck, which is a very common thing anyway. So that so they used to do that a lot. So it would have been the likes of Matavesi, um James Hook. Uh, uh, you know, take a pick of an Osprey centre with Owen Watkin. I think with the case of when you have Owen Watkin and Vardy Bosch off, is Owen Watkin has a very def- definitive role in terms of he's going to be your Bosch Bosch 12, where he's going to carry a lot more footwork into contact, things that are trying to get you over the game lane, which he generally does. When Kieran's in the team, that's clearly his job. Kieran has no other job, but he's just he's simply a, a game line uh, getter, you know, go at. Um, in this case, it's a numbers don't matter in terms of they're just there as interchangeable centres. So when you have... Um, Osprey has been trying to get the ball a lot wider this season. So you've got Owen Williams will will go out the back and often find Jack Walsh, who then can hit Owen Watkin. 
you know, if you look at the way they were set up for Morgan Morris's try, once Tipperick goes up the back, it was a poor pass to Owen Watkin, obviously has to dab it down to Jack Walsh, who then flicks it over to Owen Watkin, who's in that wider channel. And because he's comfortable running that, gives the miss pass to Morgan Morris and Morgan Morris goes over. So it is very much a case of numbers don't matter, but they do have somewhat definitive roles. So obviously, Kieran's going to be a battering ram and always be more of a link when they're both on the field together. Yeah. I have to say, as a Dragon support, I was delighted for the Ospreys. You um, can tweet in Ospreys I, I love all club. week, Jamie. It's been, I have. It's been getting on my nerves, I've got to be honest. J- J- Jamie's, well, where's the Jamie's partisan? Very where's the vocal, I'm the most... I'm, I'm balanced, mate. That's the difference. I'm not one I took like you are. See? I, I always try to be balanced for all the teams. This is the difference. No, I am. I'm, I think, I'm happy for them. Yeah. I'm happy for them. I think the, the, the thing that makes people not envious you can is, is that culture... The, the buzzword, that buzzword of culture is that culture, that of, hashtag culture, yeah. Clearly, so close and clearly want to play for each other. Is the other one is Toby Booth? Is that, you know, Jamie, like you, you yeah, yeah, you've been a very vocal supporter of, of Toby Booth. I think he's a um, great coach. I think he's a really good coach. And I wish the Dragons had a coach like Toby Booth. I really do. Soon agree. And, I, 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 what's worse if you place him in the context of the four regional coaches? Is he just talks the best, and he but he does say, um, and I've said this to him. He says what the media wants to hear, right? So he'll say that we've got an injury crisis, and then we'll send the next pre- press conference. We don't have an injury. Oh, don't say we have an injury crisis, or he, we have no money. He is very good at controlling the narrative. Dwayne Peel does need to take yeah. notes. As much as I delight in going, what lies has Toby Booth been telling this week? Yeah. It is actually the right thing to do, and I wish Dwayne Peel did it more. But he has a disdain for journalists, right? The reason I know this is because when Yeston interviewed him in the press conference last week, he hate he just looked at Yeston over the Zoom call in like a deadpan. <laughs> so why have you asked me this? Because <laughs> because he does no. If you if you look at the way every time Stephen Thomas opens his mouth in a, in a press conference, Toby Booth might as well like stab a teddy bear. Like, it, it, it's genuinely like he has a disdain for a certain type of journalism, but he's very good at controlling the narrative. But then. Mm. You put him in the in the post match uh, press conferences or post match interviews. He's really candid in that he is very play. He, he he'll never take the credit for what he's done. He will put the players first. He will champion young players. In um, look at Lewis Lloyd. Um, he'll champion like Chris Moore who came in after two training sessions. You know that that that's his mantra. So when you have some of that, that who's not who's controlling the narrative and championing young players, of course, he's going to come across very well. But it's clear that he's built a strong foundation. It's what Jockey's doing at Cardiff. You know, I wound, I wound someone up on Twitter saying, you know, Osprey's even formed a circle at the end to pay tribute to Cardiff. Uh, you know, uh, this is because it's what they do after every agonising loss. So, so yeah, I think to, yeah, Toby Booth is brilliant and he's loved by the fans as well. Like he, you he have is... started referring to him as your supreme leader, which I think is slightly problematic. I think supreme everyone just needs to booth. chill out. Yeah, no, supreme <laughs> leader booth. Um, it, but he, he's well liked. He, he is very well liked. Um, uh, and Lance Corporal Duncan Jones is as well. But he is the most oh, experienced he's head, the head coach, man, though, isn't he? Like out of the four, don't forget the other three, like Dave Flanagan, Dwayne Peel, and Jockey. They're pretty much new to head coaching. They're yeah, doing no, a job. Booth has that advantage of having that experience at other clubs. Plus, he has got the best squad to work with in Wales. Booth, Booth has only Still been a head coach a once. Job. Booth has only been a head coach once. But he's more experienced than the other three. Yeah, no, the experience, yeah. But in terms of head coaching, mm. he was Is only head just coach once? once. He was a head oh, coach okay. at London Irish in 2009. And he wasn't era. at Bath, was he? He, he was, was He was an at assistant up to Gary Gold at okay. Bath. And he right, was assist. Okay. He he was like one of the. He was like what Danny Wilson basically is at Quinns, like not a very high up coach. So in terms of head coach, no, he's not that experienced. He he, he but what he's done consistently is work with. He's always worked with the younger players in in every role he's been in. Right. This is where the Joe Cock the the Phil Cockner singer thing, I think is is a is a familial thing because he would have worked with Joe. From a very very young age, so he would have known the family. 
because if you look at Toby Booth's Twitter, he very rarely tweets. So when he does retweet, it's like motivational coaching stuff. He retweeted personally the, the, the stuff of Phil Cognisinger. Oh, and which, yeah. which to me says that, yeah, this was a, I'm going to go get you because I know you as a person as well as your rugby ability. That's good. It's really good. Right. So I got a question now for Harley and Hugh, right? When other regions are progressing in Europe and it's not your team, be honest, do you get behind them? So I've already said as a drag supporter, I'm happy to get behind the other regions. But what about you guys? Or just be honest, do you like, nah? You know, I, support, I, I, said, I genuinely support all four Welsh regions, just not necessarily to the same amount. You know, it's 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 Cardiff, yeah. Scarlets, Dragons, Ospreys. <laughs> 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 no, I, no, I so I I did since I've been doing this and since I've been doing the Scarlets Fever, um, I I have stopped supporting the Ospreys in any shape or form. But <laughs> that that is that is. <laughs> sport isn't much about who you don't like as much as who you do like so it's yes it's petty and i'll ha- happily admit it's petty everything about sport is petty so i'm not sorry uh mm-hmm. i support cardiff less than i did because of all the stick that the cardiff fans give me for no reason um <laughs> uh and uh, so i probably obviously scarlet's first then dragons then cardiff then ospreys for me but uh, i did used to support them all reasonably evenly but now since I've been doing this, I have become more petty and more partisan and more small-minded. I've become not sympathetic to Scarlet's pity them more than anything this season <laughs> because, <worse>. no, <laughs> because it's genuine. Like it, it, it was funny at first when they were losing, and then it got to Black Lion, and that was hilarious. And then I thought, yeah, but like rock bottom doesn't have a basement. Surely it can't get any worse than this. And then it just sort of kept going down, and I was like. It's not. It's not even funny anymore. Like that, there's fans genuinely distressed and are going to walk away from this club. Um, and it's. I, I like. You know. I like certain Scarlet's players. You know. I, I like. I like their history. George like North, their... Kieran Hardy, Owen Watkin. Yeah. Owen Williams, rather. Owen Watkin. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. They've all got um, the same name. But yeah, no. I, I like aspects of the Scarlet's. I, I love their their heritage. You know. I love the the the, the actual Welsh culture that they 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 do embrace really well. Cardiff, I'm less sympathetic to just because they're not you, Harley, but yeah, fans are a bunch of tossers, really. Um, oh, I, I, honest, I, I'm, I'm I, I went, well. I went, no, I went to a random Cardiff and Glasgow game a, a season or two ago. It was when that Theo, Theo Cabango had a really good game, he scored like two, really, two really good tries. That's just whenever um, he plays, it's just very rare. And, and I was stood in the south, uh, in the south stand with Bex, and I had like. A very, I, I just had an Osprey's bobble hat on it. it. Barely had an Osprey's <laughs> logo visible, and I sort of turned around to give her a drink because she was leaning up against the um, railing. And someone just shouted down to me, "You jack bastard!" And then so told me like toss her and stuff. And I just sort of looked up. And I thought, "Yeah, you are a bunch of pricks." Fair play. To be fair, though, you are a jack bastard. Uh, look, true. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna <laughs> deny it. And then dragons, <laughs> I've had nothing but good, good relationship to dragons fans they're great i like it when they come down to swansea.com um i I have not been to dave parade but yes Din really enjoys it so i think dragons fans are the ones who are aware of the glass house they're stood in and so don't throw stones whereas yeah. I think there, are, there, are, there are fans of other regions who aren't oh, aware shit. Of the... <laughs> but so are we oh, shit <laughs> what so... are going through now We've been through that for years. That's why I got those some people that scars. It's like, yeah, we've already been through that. When you say it can't get any worse, it can. <laughs> I've, been the... with, I've been following this for years. I know exactly what it's like. Don't talk it's to me. It's the denial about... for Scarlet's fans. Yeah. It's the denial. It's it's the it's the Yeah, but we're we're actually a really good team. Like we're actually a really good team, guys. I'm like and that that sort of like I listen to every fever pod, right? And at the start of the season, even though you were losing, the optimism was really high. And it was like, oh, we're trying to do it this, was. trying to do that. Yeah. And then, and then even like, here, here was a perfect example. I think what I'm saying, because I say it to him every week. And it's just like, after one week, you and Martin just snapped and all the hope just fucking <laughs> fell out. Mm. Just I can't like, remember what game it was. I think it was, I think it was Connor away. Think... And Lee was trying to talk us into it being a good yeah. performance. And we were just I like, think I think you wasn't. started to go just before that. I think it was the week, one of the weeks before. 
and because I remember like ragging on Scarlet fans after Edinburgh, because I remember Edinburgh, you were uh, you were. I was convinced we were going to beat Edinburgh. Yeah, uh, uh, and then I still think we um, are. <laughs> <laughs> and then it got to the Connor game was a really good example. Actually, you and Martin were like, "No, this is bad. Like, this is actually <laughs> genuinely bad." <laughs> so, so it is. Uh, but that's what representative what some Scarlet fans or a lot of Scarlet fans are like is that denial. But, over... so, but then you do have other Scarlet's fans who is like, it's a competition to who can be the most negative. And you do have a bit of that. And there's a lot of yeah, that on no, social media as well. There's but... a lot of that on the Osprey's yeah. Facebook as well. Osprey's Facebook is notorious for it. Like we had one, there was one guy on um, fr- uh, after the game on Saturday who was just going through the negatives. And, and you're just there like, lad, we just won a European quarterfinal and you're saying that Owen Williams is standing too deep and you know, we, you know, it's it is it is funny. It's genuinely funny. You need you've got to, to call out bad performances. So. That's fun. Yeah, you've got to call it out bad right performances. Out. You have, but not ten minutes after you've just won a knockout king. <laughs> like, oh no, it, no, no, let it settle a bit first. Yeah. yeah. Ali, are there any bad eggs amongst the Cardiff fan base that you care to, that springs to mind? Uh, none Stan. that Lee allows access to the pods. <laughs> Which caused some fantastic fun for me on my other <laughs> socials. Uh, have it, him having blocked a few of them unanimously, no matter what, on all the accounts. So, uh, but yeah, no, there are definitely some absolute assholes on on the Cardiff one. One of them presents this pod, helps present this pod in the Cardiff pod. But you know, I say <laughs> Cardiff fans are the are the best fans at replying to other teams' stuff. I don't know. Ospreys are really good for it against the Scarlets. Yeah, but that's just the Scarlets. Though. I have, I have, Os- I have Cardiff fans in in a lot of things that I tweet. You probably like... have the exact same Cardiff fans, though. <laughs> Let's be fair; it's not all the Cardiff. It's literally yeah, the, it's there are, the same three or four. There are three or four Cardiff fans go around as a little group, and they've got they've they've managed to get a Scarlets tag along as well to help. Oh, Weirdly, God. dragons. Very few dickheads Dragons fans. So and, you know, again, for Jamie's g- glass houses, stones. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to be throwing shade at any team a week, given the state <laughs> yeah. that we've been in for the past bloody ten years. But although I have done on many said, occasions, but I do know. recommend everyone if you get a chance go to a Scarlet's game with Hugh because it's hilarious. His his running commentary, Partic- well, particularly I, with I'm that going to a game, game with Hugh this week. I'm going to a game with Hugh this week. Because I decided who I'm going to support because I don't want to. I can't cheer for the Ospreys. So, he, so, so mm. I'm going to the game on Friday. But you also can't cheer for Gloucester because I know what you said about them. Yeah, yeah. I'll cheer for Max Llewellyn and nobody else. The the so before the, I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up this bit about the the Ospreys game. There. So we are going to the game on Friday as a as a pod. We're going to meet up beforehand. That's um, nice. Yeah, it's a, obviously me, me and Yes have known each other a few years now. Um. And obviously now we've got Robbie involved. So we're gonna mm-hmm. meet up. I'm taking my um my best mate and godfather to my son uh for his birthday. And the third ticket is unclaimed, so uh, Mr. Hugh Griffin is gonna travel down from Leamington. Um the the, the glory heights where all the wasp plays. Um yes, I, I would just like to point out my tickets are free. Uh, big big up to Jamal Ford Robinson, uh, Gloucester Centurion now. Um, what a crifter. You're going to have sure. to support Gloucester, or at least you know we're a half and half scarf or something. I, I, I'm I'm not. I, I I've got a great anecdote for Irie this week about rugby players and specifically a rugby player dad um, that I went to a gig to a uh, gig with in. Uh, so I went with Jamal and Ben Morgan's dad to. Um, a gig in Swansea in November 2021, and it was who's uh, have you all watched Ted Lasso? Yes, I, so, I have. Yeah. You, you know, the busker in season one who they find in Richmond Park. Oh, yes, the one man band guy. We went to yeah, see yeah. him in Swansea because he's, he's quite a heavy oh, rock right. artist, he's very, yeah. very good. Um, mm. so we went to that and just got incredibly drunk in, in the bunkhouse in Swansea, um, with Ben Morgan's dad, who's a heavy metal rocker. Um, oh, excellent. Would you... Yeah, so um, thank you, Jamal, for that. So, yeah, we're all going as a pod um, by all accounts. So, Gloucester tweeted about an hour ago that said about 7,000 tickets were sold already. I, I, I reckon Ospreys will take up 
maybe a thousand fans, thousand. which is really? which is what they they took a similar number. It was a thousand was the figure that they took to Saracens last year. Oh, they took it. Yeah. So I have already... seen a, a, a very well known Ospreys fan tweet that that Saracens game was mostly Ospreys fans. I, I wasn't there. Yestin was there, and he said, it, uh, uh, and I think Yestin and Robbie were there, is that Osprey definitely out, outsung the Saracens fan. That, that can't be hard, though, can it? Let's be honest. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I think it that's was, it was, it's a long-running joke that there's only three Saracens fans. I wonder yeah. how crud and... I've seen I've seen Saracens in two English Premiership finals, and both times there was more Wasps fans there than Saracens fans. Wasps They're not even a club. Were not in existence at the time. <laughs> so yeah, um, and they took they took they took a good. I think they took about five hundred plus up to Leicester as well. So there there is a, an appetite for away fans, and Osprey Supporters Club are very very good at organising the away travel. Like they yeah. will, they they will. So yeah, we're going up. So we're going to do some. Hopefully, do some video uh, like vlog stuff. I know he was doing one for. Uh, I'll do one as well because I'm tra- I, I'm travelling Excellent. from London up to Gloucester and then to Cardiff. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. Excellent, good stuff. Have a good day. So yeah, that's the Ospreys history makers. They finally did it. They are in the quarterfinals. Congratulations to them. Right, let's talk about women's rugby then. So Wales. Uh, it's resuming the Six Nations this weekend. So in round one, Wales lost to Scotland at Cardiff Arms Park, 18 points to 20. Very disappointing defeat. And then in round two, rather predictably, England did for Wales, 46-10. Next up, it's Ireland on Saturday at the Virgin Media Park. I think it's now called, isn't it, in Cork? So, Harley, how do we feel so far about Wales's campaign? Because it's... Two losses so far. We are bottom of the table. Do you think Wales are aggressive? Is that fair to say? Because I know you did say something to me in the group chat. It feels you you said you felt like we were regressing a little bit. How do you feel I about feel like the campaign so far? Not, I do think maybe regressing was a bit unfair. I feel like, you know, thinking about it and thinking about the opposition as well, I feel like it's more that we almost stood, certainly against Scotland, it felt like we'd stood still and they'd advanced so much more. You know, and looking at the game, it was like, Yes, our forwards and tight carry was great, and that kept us in the game. You know, if anything, if we'd drawn that game, because, you know, um, Lakey George had the last minute conversion to, to, draw, to draw the game, it would have actually yeah. been a bit unjust to how well the Scotland team had played. Against England, it looked really ropey for the first half, and then we sort of started, you know, we finished a lot stronger. I think um, Ewan Cunningham had shifted the team around, and I felt the bench had a really good impact, you know, having um, Cecilia Tulkota coming off the bench, having Kira Bevan with a steady hand on the ship. At the ship, um, mm. you know, it didn't help in the England game. We lost uh, Jazz Joyce early on to an injury, so um, Karis Cox, not Courtney, as I said on the Pirate Pod uh, last week, because <laughs> I'm a dick. Uh, Cox, now I, I, I also confused Beth and the young Lewis, so, you know, and you know, it's only one position apart, but you know, it's still stupid. I, I do apologize for that, one. but I, I feel like they should have progressed more than they have, like. We've got a good pack. We've got a decent... When the lineup functions and the driving more, it's great. The power game's there. But as I've said on numerous pods now, it's a bit like with George, what happened with Georgia when they first started regularly playing Tier 1. They had the pack to dominate lesser teams, the lower teams, because, and they could just steamroll the teams. Then when they came up to up against teams who'd also sort of stepped up in the forwards, then there was nothing behind to develop it. And I found their attacking game incredibly limited. And we're not using, you know, Lecky George for Gloucester is a fantastic tactical kicker. And we're not using that an awful lot. So I think that's where I think my rankles are is a bit more. The stuff that we're doing well was do- last year, we're still doing well, but I don't think we've impro- necessarily improved as such. But then part of that could just be because we've got a few more new players coming in, stepping in, you know, with no in the snow, so etc. Hmm. Okay. Here, what are your thoughts on Wales and the Six Nations so far and the yeah. tournament as a whole? Yeah, I agree with um, Harley on um, Wales have kind of stood still. Obviously, I think the standout players have been Beth and Lewis and Alex Callender. Um, kind of not really seeing the benefit of the Celtic challenge um, to the side, I don't think. You know, it's mostly the Gloucester, Hartbury and Bristol players. Um, yeah, to be fair, Scotland are probably the biggest progressors. 
Um, mm. They ran France very, very close at home. And they've got, you know, some very, you know, every bit of content that the women's um, Scotland team puts out, I recommend people watch because they're, it's really, really high quality stuff. Um, and you can tell they're, they're, a, they're just a great bunch and they all play for each other and they really care about each other. They refer to themselves as a family and that really comes across. Um, yeah. But from a Wales point of view, you know, you say the scoreline was an improvement against England. Um if you, it's funny, if you look at the stats for that game, you'd say that Wales played really well because it t- statistically it pit- ticks all the right boxes, but it's just a case of not not being able to do the bit that matters, which is score points. Um, and it was a case that, you know, they get into the right areas, played some good stuff, and then concede a turnover. England would just pick the ball up and run the length and score. So it was really frustrating to watch. Um, and, you know, the, I think the game against Scotland in the first game, if Wales had drawn that game as they could have done, that would have been an absolute robbery. I think Scotland were clearly the better team in that. So, yeah, a bit frustrating. It's a fascinating game against Ireland because Ireland's looked really good in the first game against France and then managed to lose against Italy, which a lot of people weren't expecting. So mm. it's it's unpredictable. It's going to be a really interesting game. Um, so definitely going to tune in for it. It's just... it's. Yeah, I can't see us. We've got France at home, but I still think France will be too strong. And yeah, I think it's it's Ireland and then then the Italy game because the Italy game is obviously at the at the Principality. You don't really want to be going in that into that with zero wins behind you. So this this Ireland has become quite a big game actually. Yeah, it is going to be a big one. James, any thoughts on the the women's tournament so far or in general? Hey, I, to be honest, I've watched, only watched bits of it. Um, I, mm. I, I watched the, I've watched England. I've watched most of the England game. It, it's very, we're getting in the right positions. We're sitting in that twenty-two, and there's just no, there's no penetration there. It's like it's like watching an Ospreys attack from like the late twenty tens. Um, it, it's just nothing. No, it, 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 it's like it's. Um, I, I, I. It's really tough. You see, like Cecilia Tupolotu is such a talent in that group, and you're like, oh, I wish you could just play 80 minutes at full strength because it would be genuinely amazing. I've always been a big Gwen Crab um, uh, fan. You know, yeah. she's from where I'm from. She's a fantastic player. I know she struggled with injury a lot. Um, What's encouraging is I'm going to pivot slightly. Is I've been watching a lot of the under 18s stuff, uh, specifically the women's under 18s, um, and there are some players in there who, if again, if we use the Celtic Challenge properly, they're in Britain, they're in Gualia, um, you know, and and used to their fullest potential, then. What the platform that Johan Cunningham's got will only be elevated further on because you know I watched Hannah Marshall who was the Ospreys ten, uh, George Iono and you know the various different players. Our Dragons, Dragons have got a very strong contingent of uh, under eighteen girls as do as do Scarlets as well. Not too sure about Cardiff, um, uh, as well as RGC. RGC actually have the strongest um, component. I'm pretty sure. Um, I've been really impressed with them. They're a really, really good win against Italy. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think it's not necessarily regressed. I think it's stagnated is the right word. Um, the bits I've seen, there are people a lot more qualified to talk um, about women's rugby than me, and I would do anything to amplify their voices. Because please don't um, listen to me. I'm only good for good player, and that's it. <laughs> One one shout out I would like to make just before we do move on is um Philippa Tutti. It's been putting out um small analysis segments on her Twitter page. Oh, she's great. Oh, they, good. And they have been absolutely yeah. fantastic. I know we, you know we were crit- you know because we were criticising how bad some of the stuff in the men's game is. I just wanted to point out how brilliant some of the coverage and the analysis in the women's game has been. All, all of yeah. all of the best presenters are women at the moment. Whether it's Gabby Logan, Lee McKenzie, Philippa Tutti, it's Lauren Jenkins. Hello, um, Sarah Elgin. Just sort of Ross Harris, though, as a presenter. I don't like him so much on comms. Oh, he, as a he can make Logan's cups of tea. 
he looked old on Friday. I don't know if you watched Gloucester cast on Friday. It was him, Matt Banahan, uh, Adam Hastings. That's who it was. Gareth Anscombe and Ross Harris. And it looked like an early 90s boy band had come back <laughs> for like a really like <laughs> shit tribute show. And he looked... I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Like Ross Harris for me was like the juggernaut of presenting rugby in like the late two thousands, early twenty tens. Like stick him in a in a grey suit in 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 the empty studio at uh, at the Swansea dot com stadium, and he's fucking brilliant. Put him with Rob Jones, but I I don't know. I just find him lifeless because he has to present with like Shanks and Jeez. these various other like yeah. And you're like, he's had all the life drained out of him. Whereas you get like Sarah Elgin, who, bless him, when she has to work with James Huff, it's like trying to pull blood out of a stone. It is. Um, <laughs> and I lo- look, I love James Huff, right? I, he's, I, I think so. when, when, he's, when he's good, he's good. But I he, watched him as like a dragon. He just described his career, though. He very briefly had a podcast. It was him. Um, who's the guy uh, played for Ulster Loads and uh, John Barkley? Very Darren briefly, oh, um... yeah, Darren Kay. Oh. Very quick, yeah. briefly had a, um, a podcast. It was at the same time that Under the Sticks was going on, and it was unlistenable. <laughs> like oh. James Hook spoke in like three word <laughs> long sentences. I, I love, I love James. I, I, there's genuinely times where I think he's he's actually he's done some decent fly half analysis. Uh, then it was it, it was it was the most recent Dragons game. I think it was a Dragon Zebra game. He was the punt. He was like the. Um, present one of the presenters for and i was just like fair play sarah elgin you deserve a fucking oscar for this <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like watching like michael parkinson interview some like a really you know terrible guest in the 70s and he's just made it look amazing oh it's oh yeah so sorry yeah all presenters oh, are bad uh, yeah <laughs> that's what we're getting at here philippa touchett is great though we've actually had her as a guest yeah, on it's the great she's been yeah. on as a guest and she was fantastic. Uh, she's yeah. quite funny as well. I, I liked yeah. her a lot. The, I think she's great. The, the analysis that she's been doing that Harley mentioned there is really good. And it just yes. makes you think like, why are we listening to David Flatman make dad jokes for 80 minutes instead of I this? I'm gonna oh, you like your Flatman's Flatman. dad jokes. Okay, I, I, okay. I will not take Flatman Flat, because he's one of the Flatman, few people who actually bothers to explain the scrum. The the banter aside, as a as a genuine analysis of the game he's probably one of the best especially from a prop point of view uh, when he the way he talks about the scrum because he'll basically go to any referee uh, a referee will give a penalty saying like one is hinging or dropping his bind he'd be like no it's actually the prop who's done that and he, he explains properly what's happened um so I, i'm going to veto you on uh, okay on, i take it back on he, he also says he explained he will explain why the ref has seen it that way even though he says technically this is probably what happened which i think is a better way to discuss a referee decision than just saying the ref shit he's done it wrong yeah. uh, listen to me i'm austin healy then an austin healy <laughs> yeah you never know maybe um, I, he'll call me to go fight in the car park at some point i need to um just uh correct myself on a point earlier you said about saracens um, I've just been told that the Ospreys actually gave out a figure of how many fans went up to um, Saracens. It was 2,500. Really? Tickets were sold via the Ospreys. Um, oh, wow. Do the so, um, supporters club keep track of how many people they helped organise travel and stuff for? Because nobody that's said. They, they, yeah, so they, well. what they, they, they'll do normally is they'll ring up and say, can we have a block sectioned off, basically? Um but the, the the figure is around twenty five hundred. I've been told. That's coming from mm-hmm. someone in Osprey's sports club. Okay, fair enough. Just before we move on, Yoan Cunningham, the Wales women's head coach, he followed me on Twitter the other day. He likes which I found uh, quite Scarlet surprising. Tweets. Does he? He, he, but he yeah. He, he follows. Sc- me. So we tweeted. Um, oh, do you remember when we beat La Rochelle in the, in the Champions Cup quarter final? That was six years ago. Um, yeah, and uh, Johan Cunningham, who was defence coach at the time, likes the tweet. Oh, so, fair enough. Yeah, obviously. So try and get him as a guest. Try and get him on as a guest on one of these pods. Oh, yeah. I, I've, all, I've I also love... got followed by Simon Ryalu the other day. Just want to throw that out. Yeah, uh, I love, I love it. A whenever a, a rugby personality 
like likes or retweets or does anything with his stuff, he'll screenshot it and send it to me straight away. He's always like a giddy kid. It's like a no, it's, it, it, mostly when it's Scarlet's players because Scarlet's are, are forbidden for taking to social media. So when they like one of our posts, it's actually they've broken the rules just to say they like us. I, I got sent a video message by Reese Henry today because it says happy twenty uh, fourth birthday, James. I'm not twenty four, right? This is for this is for my friend James for tomorrow. <laughs> but I'm just going to edit that bit out and just says hi, James, <laughs> just from Reese Henry. And that's good. It's going to go on my virtual gravestone. So he sent you that, but he hasn't said yes to being the godfather of your child, then. No, but, you know, I do like my best mate. Cardiff Saracens player, though. Oh, right. He plays, okay. he plays with Andrew Ford. Mm. Oh, that was God. funny. Did you see Andrew Ford's tweet saying, oh, you know, it's not often, <laughs> you know, Welsh clubs beating, you know, beating sale. And it's like, um, Scarlet's sale when yeah. they put 50 odd points on. I remember that, game. that. That is exactly <laughs> what he was hinting at with that tweet. <laughs> Let me just see if I can find the Scarlet's team from that day without without this turning into good are we doing player. A, are we doing an anti good player? No, because that, that Scarlet's team um, Isn't that like was the peak Scarlet's team. It was like one of the best Scarlet's 15s that's ever taken to the pitch. Uh, I can't find it now. I've got it here. I remember that game because that was the game where Murder Act came come out after the game and said the players were confused because they were doing Wales calls. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember Murderac that. Murderac on the dance floor. Right, Which it was. is one of the worst excuses I've ever heard. I, call, yeah, I bet James but, had this uh, already open in a tab, yeah, hoping this would come up. Uh, no, I just, I just searched it up instantly and got it. So, it was uh, Wynne Jones, Ken Owens, Peter Schultz. All right, take Peter Schultz out of there. Decent front, there front, you've got decent front row. Ball, Jake Ball, Sam Lousy. That's a cracking second row. row. <laughs> uh, Shingler, Jack Morgan, Sione Callum Foley. <laughs> Fucking Absolutely hell. fantastic, Pat. Right, Pat. I don't think you've had a better back row since. Um, no. Gareth Davis, Dan Jones. Yeah, right. Oh. Uh, McNichol on one wing, Liam Williams on the other. Not bad. This is a half minute full back game. Uh, Johnny Williams, Steph Hughes. Johnny Williams did go off after 33 minutes, so I will say. Of course he so. did. And it uh, and, and Lee Half Penny at full back. So we had the ultimate. I think that's probably the only time those three played together in the in the back three. So then you had Elias, Steph Thomas, and Javin Sebastian on bench. Who who on Sky Sports is just listed as Sebastian, like he's some sort of um <laughs> Latin American singer. Um, of, of then you had Lewis Rollins, uh, Blade Thompson, Dame Blacker, Sam Costello, and Foxy on the bench. Not a bad team at all, is it? That's when Foxy battered. was mobile as well. Yeah, and, and uh, just it, the sale, it was, the sale one wasn't bad. Uh, no, I think Ben Curry or Tom Curry was the only international in that sale team that day. Because it was uh, was this twenty twenty one? Because I think Wales had won the Six Nations the week before, and then basically the yeah, Wales and they team took all their, out. they took all their internationals back, and they just yeah had no. I mean, idea Sale had Will Griff John. Uh, wasn't just, international. Yeah. Right? Oh no, he was. He had just about. He had just yeah. about got a cap then, hadn't he? No, he didn't get cap until he'd Scarlet. already played for Scarlets. Will Griff John got the best age in world rugby that bloke. He'll sale. never go without a top job. And <laughs> where this flogging sale about... tight head props is is doing a heck of a job, to be honest, because they've just got Scarlets on speed now. I don't know. He does it. He fails upwards. That guy. Fair play to <laughs> Will Griff John is going to like Moana Pacific. He's going to be a lion next, or like Fiji and <laughs> to lose be about that. If, if Mark Orders was picking the British and Irish Lions, Will Griff John would be in there. <laughs> we sweat. Right. I genuinely okay. do not know how, how he got that impression of him being a really good scrummager because he never no. played for sale. <laughs> no, he didn't. Right, uh, let's move on then. So Gloucester Ospreys, the big one, Friday night. James. What are you expecting from this game? How do we feel about it? How big a challenge is this going to be for the Ospreys? Uh, it definitely presents a different challenge. Um, mm. It would be a wider game. Uh, I mean, the last time Ospreys went away to a team that had Zach Mercer at eight, we won. So, um, taking that niche stat there. Uh, no, it would be a very different game. Gloucester, uh, Gloucester have a choice whether they want to Finish strongly in the Prem because they are. Was it one from bottom at the minute? But the points they are, gap yeah. to eighth is 
pretty big. It's unlikely yeah. that they're going to get top eight. But they're not a team that wants to get whipped every week in the Prem. Is the issue. Mm. And they went very strong against Cast and struggled a bit against Cast. Um, so, it, 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 you know, is is one of the 12 Atkinsons going to start? Is, you know, it, it, essentially who? Yeah, who, who, who? Who are they going to put out? And again, Australia can't control that. They have to play. I they I think they will put out a full strength team. Um, it, it's, I I think we might have the edge a bit physically up front. Yeah. Um. It's it, but it's a four G fast track. They've got game breakers in like Coelin, um, Santi Carreras. Um, they've got three really sharp nines, Kaelin Englefield, um, Stephen Varney, Charlie Chapman. I'm not sure if Varney's injured, though. He might not be. I think he played. He did play Friday. Yeah, I think he was fine. And I think he came through it fine. I don't think he was supposed um, to start. I think Chapman pulled up or something and he started. Yeah, started. Uh, it was Eng- Englefield pulled up, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you've got players like Ollie Thorley, who I really like. Who is who is never going to be an international player, but is a bloody good club player. So it's going to be a challenge. I, I I don't expect us to win simply on the fact that it's away, and King's Home is a very finicky and tough and just gnarly place to go. But it's not exactly a fortress. You know, Bristol went and did a bit of a smashing grab recently. Cast put up a much better fight than they had any right to. I mean, Cast went there in the group stages um, and got smashed and then took an even more rotated squad on uh, Friday and, and put a you know, good performance in. So, yeah, I, I, I just think there's got to be... I mean, we've got to take our points, so the missed points from Owen Williams can't happen. I think they no. need to give Jack Walsh the kick and tee. Um, Jack Walsh is... If you base it on twenty plus kicks, he is like what top six or something like that in the in the URC this season um, for kicking percentage. So, yeah, we've come through it relatively unscathed in terms of injury. So news wise, Jack Morgan and Derry Lake are not going to be ready. Um, they are more looking like the South Africa, the tour to South Africa. Okay, Sam Parry has seen a consultant this week. Um, to see basically how bad his hip injury is, um, which is never a good sign. So I've reserved that he's not playing. Do, do you think um, he was ever fit for the weekend, or do you think that was mind yeah, games from Boothie? Hundred percent, he was never fit. I heard. I I I, I said this from the start. <laughs> he was not fit. I said I I would not I would not believe the Ospreys until five minutes in, and he's like carried the ball twice. <laughs> Given um, that Lance Bradley tweeted during the game, it's not raining. <laughs> I don't think yeah. much of the Ospreys. Well, it, it, in, all, in all fairness, we put this in the chat as well. It wasn't raining when he tweeted it. <laughs> and then it just started pissing down. Um, so I expect we'll see pretty much the same squad. I, the only rotation I can see is potentially he'll put um, Nicky Smith in at Luke's head. Mm. Um, but Gareth Thomas scrums really well. So, yeah, I, I have no genuine analysis apart from vibes because I'll be at the game so I'll just be uh, yes you have mentioned vibes. that yeah on a freebie yeah. as well Grifton yeah. top Grifton yeah. well done top Grifter I, I will but... say that we need to give Gloucester the respect of being the Premiership Rugby Cup champions beat Leicester in the final um, oh so yeah that point... farce of a game <laughs> I didn't watch it um, I it can tell you actually I was looking up because I expected uh, I'm looking at their results now I was expecting to just see a stream of L's they've actually won uh, ones they've only lost one in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they've won seven out of eight recently, which is surprising. Only three of those, only two of those wins are actually in the Premiership. Though all the rest are either Challenge Cup or Premiership Cup. Yeah, uh, and that's the thing, isn't it? So I just want to come to you then, Ali. So Gloucester, they're not really pulling up trees in the Premiership, but I suppose they will be favourites because they're at King's Home, but. This is a winnable game for the Ospreys, isn't it? Because a lot of people are writing them off and I quite fancy them. Well, what do you think? I think that anything this season's shown, you can't really write off the Ospreys. You know, they, they're a really tough mm. group. They've been 
together four years now. You know, they've had a lot of time to get systems in place. That is a fantastic pack. You know, that is a pack you could start an international game with. I, I, I stand by it. It's really great. Yeah. Yeah. And they know how to win. They know how to play for each other. You know, all the, you know, all the boothy, boothy cliches can come out of the cupboard. You know, and actually, I thought, despite the fact you had to come in last minute, I thought um, Lewis Lloyd actually had a really good game at Hooker, really solid. Great. I was really impressed with him and the um, young men's lad. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not surprised Sam Perry had a hip injury. Having, I mean, what business, what business, poor bastard having to run from at least 10 metres away, not one metre. I mean, it was very ironic. Bastard, really. He's definitely it never done very that. Ironic. It's very <laughs> ironic that he scored a try from that far out. And his 150th game injury. having to score after having scored about seven thousand from a meter out, and um, then gets the hip injury, which is what happens to me what, if I haven't run yeah. in a few weeks. <laughs> My hip goes. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, you're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Lewis Lowe played excellent. I thought he he really he captured that form he had for the under twenties, and I know he was a fan of that under twenties team from the summer just gone. Because it has that axis of Dan Edwards, Bryn Radley, and um, was it Louis Hennessy? Yeah, um, such a good midfield. But but Lewis Lloyd was a part of that pack, and it was just he he scored loads. And he he's just very dynamic. Uh, carry the field. The 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 four G surface does. Are Ospreys going to revert to type and be a bit tighter? Are they going to play a bit wider? You know how, how how do they approach a four G surface? But they train on four G, don't they? The Ospreys is that correct? But tra- training and playing are two very different things, because when if if you think this week they would have trained on a four G surface, but in the tactics they would play on a heavy foot pitch. I can pretend. Well, yeah. So they 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 weren't going to play. They were train. I, I guarantee they wouldn't train as wide as they would normally would. Whereas this week they're on a four G pitch where. The it's going to be dictated by how slippery the ball is, so they're going to play it. They're probably going to train and play a bit wider. If you look, they're probably their forward carries are going to be maybe two meters more wider mm. off the ruck than they would normally. Yeah, you know, stupid analysis stuff like that is what will happen on a four G pitch. It doesn't change things like scrummaging. It, it generally doesn't. Uh, having scrummed on four G a lot this season, it doesn't change anything. All it does is it just makes it a lot easier to run on because you're not having to exert so much energy getting out of mud. You like playing on 4G pitches. I don't hate them. Harry Deves doesn't. He loves playing on grass. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I don't hate uh, I don't hate 4G pitches. Uh, they're, they're annoying. That the you know, And if they're not properly maintained is where you get genuine burns and things like that. Mm. Um but when they're probably yeah. made, by all accounts, Gloucester's one is is fine. Do you remember years ago, Adam Warren played for the Dragons? Um, he played up in Glasgow. He slid in for a try and he took half his face off. Mm. Do you remember okay. that? That's one of the most gruesome uh, burns I've seen. It's horrible. It was it's like Freddy Krueger. That was one of the first four, four Gs as well, though. So I think they're still, as they're working, they're getting better and better for them. I remember the Cardiff yeah. one with all the little black balls and I remember all the players getting like purple knees and stuff off it and... well that's that's what I mean in terms of there's too many of them mm. and they're not properly maintained yeah I think that, okay, I, said, yeah. I think that was as well Cardiff was, 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 do you remember when the Dragons had their pitch it was due to be relayed but for various reasons they couldn't get in to relay it so it ended up becoming a bit of a state and everyone moved about yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, it was a boxer day on New Year's Day one wasn't it the, that year I, I I thought it was more towards the end of the year, and it was yeah, it was just basically it sort of cut up because there was just too much sport on there, and and it was time to, to relay the pitch. And they it's a lovely pitch now, though, at Rodney Parade. People yeah, can... Rodney Parade looked very good. I gotta say, with with a bit of investment, because I know there's talks on going at the minute. As venturing off topic, because I, I was reading some Newport County stuff, they they're renewing their deal, aren't they, to play at Rodney Parade? Yeah, um, with a bit of investment, those. I genuinely think that. It could be one of the best looking grounds in in, in the Uk. I think I love Rodney Cardiff Parade. to cap. It's a really good location as well. Because that's it. City said the location. You know, the, the few times I've gone there, I've, we've driven once, which is near a really nice multi-story car park, but it's also quite close to the Newport Central Station. I, I got to say, cap, and restaurants around. Cap as well. is a shithole. 
Yeah. I mean, this is the no, location, though, isn't no, it? No, it is. A shame. Yeah, like, it's Ronnie a great Parade location. Is a fall, but it's great such location. A shame Ronnie Parade. Yeah. The cap is just so delightful. I remember I hadn't been there in years, and I went up there with university to watch Swansea be Cardiff. And I was just shocked. It was almost like stepping back in time. Um, and the worst thing is, we can't, we're not allowed to do anything with it because of the lease. Well, I'm saying we are not involved, but because of the lease, but also we're not touching it until after 2026 when the euro when we've had the euros I went and there's issues the with um there's issues because like for wales games we've got to get all the tv trucks parking cap so we've got to i went into the clubhouse right and they oh, didn't the take card right. when i went in there i'm like it's 2022 like that's different now that's a little okay, bit well, that's all right then. james are just getting all these shots in before they go to st helens yeah i've just some chili st helens yeah um yeah you can pay tired, the chickens and hens to it is tired, tired is dilapidated and tired is, is the, yeah the, and some the, parts of on the parade is tired like the hazel stand or the compete stand that's not where i'm sat i'm in the posh seats but yeah, that side in. the ground is don't very look tired. Tired. where have you sat the last couple of dragons games jamie at home there's that story. I I, 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 yeah. I I may have been in hospitality <laughs> yeah i may have been in the <laughs> Such a how much, how much did that cost you, Jamie? Was that a friend? Call was that the, uh, call your friend? Uh... <laughs> I was doing some top drifting. That's all I could say. No, <laughs> yeah, to be exactly, fair, yeah. I never asked for it. I never asked for it. I was offered it, and I said yes, of course. Of course I'm going to turn free food and drink. Come on, come on, lads. Oh, me- meanwhile, right, every t- every time there's um, Simon Mudrak and John Daniels get asked about how the Scarlets are doing, they go, "Cool, Parker Scarlets is nice, isn't it? You know, it's posh ground that." <laughs> <laughs> Whenever. <laughs> They're always tweeting how hospitality is sold out. <laughs> no other club does that. No other club tweets that hospitality is sold out. That's true. Right, let's move on then. Let's move on to uh, predictions and then we'll wrap up. So let's start with the women. So Ireland versus Wales. Harley, your prediction, please. This, this is a hard one because Ireland, Ireland have improved quite a lot in spite of everything going on with them. Yeah, have they performed? A, you know, and basically the big thing I'm running from is the Celtic challenge. They walked, Wolfhounds and Clovers basically walked through it. Do we have enough? Because obviously the main Wales players were playing; they were playing Premiership. I'd like to think after these extra two weeks, and um, I'm hoping now that the back line sort of starts clicking a little bit more. Because although it was mostly a Gloucester Hartbury team, as I discussed in the point rugby pod, actually if you look at along the spine, it isn't. <laughs> It isn't one unified thing, so hopefully those extra couple of weeks in camp would have helped. Um, I still think Wales, though it's going to be difficult, I'd, I'd say Wales by about three or four, whereas before the tournament I was probably saying Wales by 15. So, mm. yeah, I'm not as confident as I probably would have been before the yeah. previous two games. This does feel like a must win for Wales, doesn't it? Especially with you yeah. know France coming up. and yeah. What about you then, Cat? Boy, what do you think? Ireland yeah, versus it's a, Wales. It's a tough game. I'm going to pick Wales to win, obviously. Um, mm. But it's a tough one. It's difficult. It's very difficult to get a read on Ireland because they you you saw them against France and you're expecting them to get battered and they performed okay. But then you're expecting them to beat Italy and they played well but somehow lost. Um, yeah, we're going to go something like 17-15 to Wales and just to... Wales to win it somehow, and um, Cecilia to a to score twice. Okay, Wales by two. Then you're saying, okay, James. Uh, I'll go Wales by three. Um, I, I think there's a reaction needed, and you know, this is yeah. the perfect time to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to give a lead prediction and say Wales by one. Is my my prediction here by one point. Okay, so Gloucester versus Ospreys. So last night, there was a guy on Twitter saying to me that Gloucester are going to win comfortably. And he yeah, I saw that completely well. wrote off, yeah, he completely wrote off the Ospreys. Gloucester will win comfortably. You know, Ospreys beat a second string sale. Da, 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 da. I'm not having it. I'm not. I, I don't think Gloucester are going to beat Ospreys comfortably. I fancy the Ospreys. And that's how he said earlier. They've got the pack to go there. And compete and to lay that platform. I I do. I fancy the Ospreys for this game. Gloucester aren't that good. King's Home is a tough place to go. Admittedly, it is. But I I fancy the Ospreys this, and so I'm going to say Ospreys by six. What do you think, Harley? I I, mean, I think Gloucester flattered to see because for all they talk about having a nice wide expansive game, 
they seem to be stuck in two places where the back right is a, a, you can translate this to Ulster as well. So you've got a back line that's there for shaping. I mean, if they put careers at 10, it looks even worse, but that's my opinions on putting full backs at 10. See Tell me about it. You and Lloyd. Um, but the pack, <laughs> a lot of these quite heavy pack builds, they, they're more forward orientated. With I mean, Zach Nurse has helped with that. He's sort of just linking these two quite nicely together. But if you look at like, it's like Ruin Ackerman, Ruin Ackerman, Ben Morgan when he's playing, they're just big, heavy mm. set piece grunt works. And I do think as good as set pieces the Ospreys are actually, I'd say their back five is the margin would it be the margin more mobile, depending on the second row pairing. Um, it would I think be the same set. and Ratty, I quite like that. That's quite quite nice because we've spoken before about how Beard is a bit more of a link man. He's not that hard grunt. He's not that dog work. Whereas James Ratty probably is a bit more. And having Deves and Deves and Tipperick and Morgan Morris, you make up for that quite well. So yeah, I. I honestly don't know where to put my hat on this one because I really want, I want Max Swelling to have if Max Swelling get man of the match and Ospreys win by three that that would be perfect game for me. <laughs> You're going to predict Max Swelling to score a hat trick and then when it turns out he's not in the actual team sheet you're going to tweet saying do you know what I'm changing my predictions of Ospreys by twenty four just because Max Swelling's not playing. What can I say? I love Max Swelling ever since he brought me a VK shameless line. shameless man. Well, I, I, have that have shame. I have plenty of pride, but no shame. <laughs> <laughs> What's your prediction? I said, I, 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 I think Osprey's by about three. I think, I think Osprey's they can squeak three. it. Okay, Phil. Um, Ospreys have got by far the better squad. They're playing by far the better rugby. Gloucester are second bottom in a league. It's impossible to be bottom in because Newcastle play in it. Um, it the Ospreys by twenty. They are clearly a better team. If they lose, 20? it's a failure. I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we know what he's league. doing there, James. Don't yeah. we? We know it's what he's doing there. Oh, um, dear. James? <laughs> uh, Wonder which way um, you're going to go. <laughs> uh, Osprey's by four. Um, it's it's knockout rugby, isn't it? So you yeah. have to strike the balance of going for the corner, taking the points. Things like that, and we. Str- I think we did. I think both teams struggled that on Friday. Is they're both like, let's just try and outscore each other, whereas we should have maybe gone and taken some more points early on. The sales should have done the same. Um, so I think if we're a lot more streetwise, I think we'll. I, I think we can win. I think we'll go Australia by four, and it'll be it'll be something like twenty six, twenty two, or something like that, or twenty two, twenty six. The Ospreys. Um, Gloucester to score last and give you massive squeaky bum time. Yeah, no, the, the Ospreys way. I, I said this to Jamie in the rap chat that day. It was twenty to three, and, and Jamie was like, "Surely you've got this wrapped up by now." And I'm like, "Jamie, this is the Ospreys we're talking about now. I mean, it's not all this season. It's yeah, not the Ospreys is, way. <laughs> it's not wrapped up until like uh, until the scorecards commit submitted uh, in the clubhouse after the game. Like, that that's." Yeah. That's how little confidence I have in our ability to close out games. In, in the World Cup, when Wales were beating Australia by 40 points and there's five minutes to go, and my girlfriend comes in and she's like, oh, you've won this. I was like, shit, shit, just, this could go wrong yet. Yeah, it's the same with the Dragons, though. Um, like, the Dragons could go 30 nil up with, like, 10 minutes left to go, and they still wouldn't trust them to win. They still find a way to boss it up. That's how little trust I have in the Dragons. And I have seen them lose so many times for winning positions in the last 10 minutes or so. So I do understand that feeling. But um, yeah, good luck to them. Good luck to the Ospreys. Good luck to Wales women. Gentlemen, that's a wrap. Harley James, thank you as always. Hugh, thank you for stepping in for Lee tonight. That's much appreciated. My pleasure. We'll be back next week. No problem. Uh, we'll be back next week. So until then, take care and goodbye. Last time. I know.